Marxism and Freedom by Rhea Dunayevskaya, Chapter 15, The Beginning of the End of Russian Totalitarianism. 1. East Germany, June 17, 1953. The myth that the Russian totalitarian state is invincible was suddenly and strikingly shattered. On June 17, 1953, the workers in the East German satellite took matters into their own hands on the questions of speed up. They moved speedily, confidently, courageously, and in an unprecedented manner to determine the puppet state. Heretofore, absenteeism and slowdowns were the only weapons used by the workers against the intolerable conditions in the factories. But the struggle reached a new and higher stage of opposition in late spring of 1953. Here is a brief chronicle of the events leading up to June 17th and the days that followed. Beginning with May 18th, the communist government announced a new increase in work hours. The German workers bro broke out in open strikes. In one effort to stop the strikes, the communist government on June 10th offered concessions on all points except speed up. On June 16th, construction workers organized a protest march against speed up from the Stalin Alley housing project. The government sent its supporters to join the marchers, apparently hoping to appear as a sponsor. But as the marchers approached the government, joined en route by swelling numbers of demonstrators, the cry had become, down with the zones, down with the government. The government then admitted it had been doing wrong and issued an order revoking the speed up. It was too late. By the evening of June 16th, the workers had turned the streets of East Berlin into political centers. On block after block, hundreds of people assembled and discussed what to do next. Early on, early on the morning of June 17th, they acted. Columns of strikers charged the main government buildings where the government bureaucrats cowered. Reluctant police moved into pre-arranged positions. Youth and workers tore down the symbols of communist power, flags, posters, pictures of communist leaders. Despite rifle shots, one young man clambered up the famous Brandenburg Gate and tore down the communist banner. Dispersing on one street and surging up another, the swelling ranks of strikers chanted, We will not be slaves. For four hours, the only power in East Berlin belonged to the workers. They, in fact, overthrew the East German government. They destroyed the police power, burning barracks, throwing policemen out of windows, and forcing them to flee to the west or to come over to the side of the workers. At 1 p.m., the Russian command marched into Berlin with 10,000 troops and decreed martial law. Street gatherings of more than three people were forbidden. The people laughed at the order. At the same time, in Jena, strikers from the Zeiss optical factory stormed the Communist Party and Communist youth offices and hurled books, papers, typewriters out of the windows and burned them. At the Kodak Supplies Plant, the workers took over and put strikers in charge. State railway workers walked out, crippling zonal intercommunications and halting the shipment of reparations into Russia. Construction workers cut power cables at both elevated and subway lines and blocked the tracks. 25,000 workers at the Luna Chemical Plant, formerly IG Farben, at Halley set the plant afire. The workers at the Buna synthetic rubber plant burned it down. These plants were the chief suppliers of gas and tires to the occupation army. The hard coal area at Zwickau was damaged beyond estimate. The demonstrators set fire to huge piles of coal between Halley and Magdeburg. They destroyed uranium mining facilities. They opened prisons and concentration camps to set free the political prisoners. At Gera, an industrial city about the size of Cincinnati, near the Russian-operated uranium mines of Saxony, thousands of workers struck and marched on the city prison, demanding release of its political prisoners. 
Later in the day, 5,000 uranium miners from nearby Ronenberg joined the Gera workers. They knew German police from the windows of their barracks, or they threw German police from the windows of their barracks. Russian reinforcements were called. This time they came with tanks. The workers concentrated their anger against the German communist officials who acted as agents of the government. At Rathenau, they killed a factory guard when he tried to stop the strikers from entering the plant. At Erfurt, they hanged two red policemen from lamp posts. By Saturday, June 20th, the Russians had sent 25,000 troops to Berlin from their 300,000 man occupation force at nearby Potsdam. In every major city, Russian power supplanted East German puppets police power, or puppet police power. The Minister of Justice was purged. One half of the German police were demobilized as unreliable and sent into the plants to work. In small but significant numbers, Russian soldiers defected to the workers of East Germany, as became apparent when the demonstration subsided and 18 Russian soldiers were speedily executed for mutiny. 20 to 30,000 strikers were jailed. Untold dozens were executed. Families of convicted strikers were driven from their homes and sent to concentration camps. But on June 22nd, the city of Leipzig, showplace of East German communism, was still paralyzed by a general strike. Strikes by the workers in the rest of Eastern Europe followed. The Russian bureaucracy slept uneasily and Beria, who was directly in charge of the satellites, was to feel it most keenly for it was the beginning of his end. Above all, it was the regaining of the workers' confidence in the struggle for freedom. The East Germans wrote a glorious page in this struggle for they answered in an unmistakable aff affirmative, can man achieve freedom out of the totalitarianism of our age. Even the slave laborers in Vorkuta heard this answer, whereupon they wrote the second page in the new struggle for freedom. Two, Russia's more than ever full of revolutionaries, for Kuda, July 1953. The impulse to, or to organized resistance, which sparked through the slave labor camps in the Siberian wastes with Stalin's death, was rekindled by the East German events and burst into an open strike by 10,000 miners in the slave camps at Vorkuta. That was July 1953. Two Germans, former inmates of the Varkuta camps, Dr. Joseph Schulmer and Bridget Gerland, have told the story of those heroic days. They were two of the several thousand German inmates who had suddenly been amnestied for the show at the Big Four Ministers' Conference in Berlin in January 1954. You all seem to be so skeptical about the chances of a revolution in Russia. I am not sure myself. But believe me, Russia is more than ever full of revolutionaries. Thus, Bridget Gerland addressed her co-journalists attending that conference in 1954. Her audience was very skeptical because she was not telling a tale of woe, but of revolt. She would have found sympathetic listeners had she engaged in an abstract discussion of whether a revolt can occur under a police state, but not when she related that one has happened. Prior to June 17th, all the preparations for resistance to the totalitarian rulers were based on the eventualities of war and the slave laborers looked to the Western rulers. When Stalin died in March 1953, hope spread through the camps. But all that came from the Eisenhowers and Churchills were condolences to the Russia, Russian leaders who continued the Stalin regime. Gloom spread throughout the slave labor camps until the June 17th revolt in East Germany showed that liberation can be achieved only by the workers themselves. The Russian political prisoners followed up with their revolt. Here is how Dr. Scholmer, who had actually participated in the strike, described it. A strike of more than 10,000 miners lasting for several weeks with all the usual paraphernalia, strike committees, slogans, pamphlets, and of course, black legs a strike similar in every respect to that other historic strike in the Lena Gold, Goldfields Company's mines in Siberia in 1912, when the Tsarist police fired into the strikers, just as the communists were to do in 1953. 
Nothing shows the uncertainty and insecurity of these totalitarian rulers, armed to the teeth and with all the power and terror in their hands as the caution with which the government at first dealt with the strike. They sent a commission, headed by General Derevyanko, to fly to the camp. When he tried to harangue the prisoners and failed, the commission returned to Moscow with the demands of the prisoners for a review of all their cases and the removal of the barbed wires. In the end, the Kremlin did what the Tsar had done back in 1912. They opened fire on the unarmed strikers, killing 64 and wounding some 200. But they could not put back what the strikers had destroyed, the myth of invincibility. These prisoners without any rights had dared to strike. They held out for weeks, shaking the Kremlin to its very foundations. Despite total censorship, the workers in Leningrad knew at once of the strike. A few months after, students from the Leningrad Mining Institute working in the pits in Vorkuta, told the prisoners how everyone had talked of the strike in Leningrad. We soon got to know you were on strike. The drop in coal was noticeable at once. We don't have any reserves. There's just the plan, that's all. And everyone knows how vulnerable plans are. It destroyed the myth that the system was unassailable. Of the Western experts on Russia, Dr. Schulmer had this to say. When I first mentioned the word civil war to these people, they were appalled. The possibility of a, rising, of a rising lay outside their realm of comprehension. They had no idea that there were resistance groups in the camps. I talked to all sorts of people in the first few weeks after my return from the Soviet Union. It seemed to me that the man in the street had the best idea of what was going on. The experts seemed to understand nothing. Asked what were the motives of the strike, Dr. Schulmer said, oh, they were fantastically mixed. Some wanted a little better living and working conditions. Others were hoping for a new era now that Stalin was dead. Some wanted to imitate the 17th of June in Germany, which we had heard described over Radio Moscow and in Pravda. Others wanted to destroy the system. And there was an old man in my barracks who cried over and over again. Have we torn down the barbed wire fence yet? Is it down? Is it down? No, the barbed wire has not been torn down. The freedom from Russian totalitarianism was not won by the East German revolt either. But two new pages in history were written. Whoever before June 17th had heard of a mass revolt against a total totalitarian dictatorship? Whoever had, before July, heard of slave laborers forcing concessions from a police state? two pages in history that have shown the way to freedom. That is why the former inmates speak not so much of suffering as of revolt, of freedom. Not yet, not yet, they too say, and go back to quote the great Russian poet Pushkin, who back in 1827 wrote to his imprisoned friends, Deep in the Siberian mine, keep your patience proud. The bitter toil shall not be lost, the rebel thought unbowed. The heavy hanging chains will fall, the falls will crumble of a word, or the walls will crumble at a word, and freedom greets you in the light, and brothers give you back the sword. 3. Hungary, 1956, Freedom Fighters Russian soldiers go home became the central rallying slogan of the Hungarian Revolution, which broke out on Tuesday, October 23rd, 1956. It followed the Polish revolt of the previous week. It was distinguished from the previous revolts by the greater depth, the uncompromising stand, and the involvement of the whole population. As in all popular revolts, the soldiers came over to the side of the people. The freedom fighters of Hungary embraced all layers of the population, workers, youth, and women, the old and the very young. They united behind a common cause, to rid themselves of their Soviet oppressors or to die in the attempt. Children from 12 to 16 years of age were seen with rifles and Tommy guns slung over their shoulders and hand grenades in their pockets. They destroyed Soviet tanks by diverting the attention of the gunners to the rooftops, then dashing in under the elevated guns to throw gasoline over the tank and set it afire. Others led the tanks down narrow streets where they were ambushed and unable to turn around. 
One 13-year-old veteran of this kind of fighting was asked where they learned to do these things. She said, all of us kids were trained in the party. The attempts of the workers to seize oil fields, rail centers, steel factories, and means of communication, and to run these by revolutionary committees, that is to say, workers' control of production, is the true sign of the attempts of this revolution to effect a total change. A general strike tied up all railroad transport, as well as most production. Death and starvation stalked the streets of Hungary as the rebel radio station sent out its last SOS. We are quiet, not afraid. Send the news to the world. The news to the world about five days of freedom revealed more than courageous fighting. It showed that the idea of freedom cannot be killed. The idea does not float in heaven. People live by that idea. Overnight, the one-party system disintegrated and various political parties reappeared, along with small newspapers and radio stations. Hundreds of local and district organizations from the Hungarian Re Revolutionary Youth Party to old parties, including both smallholders and social dem democrats, appeared. So total was the wrath of the people against Russian communism that the Hungarian Communist Party tried to appear in a new guise. The temporary puppet leader, Janos Kadar, reorganized it as the Socialist Workers' Party, but no one took that seriously. Indeed, it was the same old communism which, while promising withdrawal of the Russian troops and a different way of living, was conspiring to bring back the Russian tanks and troops in force. The first news to the world was about five days of freedom from Russian tyranny and from the Hungarian communist uh, barbaric 10,000 man secret police. And then the news that the wrath of the people in arms was being stifled by a force of 4,500 Soviet tanks, crack paratroops, MV MVD storm guards, and a quarter of a million of Russian infantry. Yet this massacre of the, dating, or of the daring young freedom fighters had not crushed the revolt. After a full week of fighting, the uranium mines were blown up. There, workers were still out on general strike, and there was neither transport nor production. The Hungarian people were choosing death rather than accept Russian totalitarianism. Even the cynics who thought it wishful thinking for anyone to analyze the East German revolt of 1953 as the beginning of the end of totalitarianism began to look to Hungary with non-cynical hope. Many thousands fled and every reactionary with their own Congressman Walter of the infamous McCarran Walter Act at the head tried to ride on the bravery of the Hungarian revolutionaries. But the impact soon overrode these hangers on. The whole brunt of the fight shifted back inside Hungary itself. When all said, when all said that everything was over, the Hungarian workers' councils sprung up. Production remained the key, and the whole brunt of the struggle against Russian tyranny was borne by the workers. They began to fight in the factories which they were using as their places of refuge. The leaders of the workers' councils were arrested only after they left the factory and walked to the parliament building to negotiate. The workers evolved new ways of fighting, both on the job and when they walked out on strike. For example, the miners refused to mine coal while the Russian army remained in Hungary nor did they let anyone else mine the coal for the workers. When Russian, when Russian might finally asserted itself through overwhelming force, the workers blew up the mines. The revolutionary forces now unloosed cannot be overcome by sheer force. They have been forced underground, but they have not disappeared. Nor was the impact exhausted within the national boundaries of Hungary. Thousands of Communist Party members all over Western Europe began tearing up their membership cards. Ever since the end of World War II, the West European people, veering sharply against the private capitalism that they knew and hated because it had brought them two world wars in one lifetime, had turned to Russian communism, literally by the millions. Many now see Russian communism as but another name for state capitalism. The tearing up of Communist Party memberships cards is the first step. It is a first step that was not taken in 1953 during the East German revolt 
nor just a few months previous to the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, during the Polish Revolt, although the slogans during the latter were almost identical. Down with this phony communism, and we want bread and freedom. It was taken only when the revolution was such a thoroughgoing one that it turned both against Russia and the satellite communist regime in Hungary. This Western beginning may not yet reflect the deep and continuous unrest in Poland, but it is a first step in the disintegration of the mass communist parties in Western Europe. It is a beginning only, but it is a beginning.